and torture and imprisonment. Now I'm going to give you the last one and I'll finish. The, pers the, the preachers of the gospel are per persecuted because God told us it would happen. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and, and hate you and say all manner of evil against you. What, what does that imply? It's going to happen. And that's the implication there. It's not if, it's when, Jesus says. And when he sends the disciples out in Matthew 10, he says the, the same things there in John 17. In the high priestly prayer of the Lord, the 14th verse, he says, I have given them my word and the world have hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. It's a promise. In fact, I submit, it's an evidence of salvation. If you are well liked because of what you say, and again, it was so—it's so true. Uh, I've told the kids uh, that uh, our children the exact same thing. People will have this this um, this struggle within themselves. They'll really like you. They'll like the kind of person you are, but they will absolutely hate what you stand for, and they don't know what to do with it. If there is not that kicking back of what you proclaim. I had a guy ask me one time, are you automatically cynical of anything that's popular in the church? I didn't bat an eye. I didn't blink. I didn't take a breath. I said, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely I'm cynical of anything that's popular in the church in America. I had a guy tell me one time, he's, he's been raised Baptist or self-proclaimed atheist. He said, you know what preacher I really like? I thought, oh, here it comes. This ought to be good. I said, do tell. He said, I like Joel Osteen. I said, that doesn't surprise me at all. I said, Osteen is not a preacher of the gospel. Sinclair Ferguson makes a statement that the Christian who doesn't anticipate opposition is the Christian who doesn't yet understand the nature of the Christian life. We shouldn't be surprised by any of this. Let me give you one passage left and then, 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 then I'm done. Look over at Acts 4. Acts chapter 4. You have the persecution of the apostles that is indicated here. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy in chapter 5, it says, verses 40 and 41, that uh, they, uh, count, they, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. But you look at, at chapter 4, And verse 23, being let go, they went to their own company, reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God who has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. This is all God's doing. God is in control. God is in control. I'm not wringing my hand saying, what in the world? God did not see that the election would be stolen. He's trying to figure out what happened. Let me just give you my take on it because you asked. Was the election stolen? No. You know why? And I think evangelical America is having difficulty with this. It didn't have to be. This is what America wants. This is, was there voter fraud? Well, sure, there's voter fraud in every election. I mean, every election. Was it stolen? I don't think so. It didn't have to be. This is what America wants. Does that not make sense? Did we not expect this? Why are we surprised? Who is in leadership in America? Look at America. 
You know what my argument before the Supreme Court would be? I'm glad I didn't have to do the argument. They didn't ask. On Obergefell. I mean, what are you going to say? What is the argument here? You can argue from a social aspect, and everything that you can say from that argument can be, can be counterattacked. Here's the reason. God said so. Why is homosexuality, homosexual marriage, wrong? God said so. The, I rest my case. I mean, what else do you say? There is nothing to say above God said so. Bottom line. Well, God gives reasons. I understand that. But, the, but before that is preceded the authority of the spoken word of God. What's their reaction here? Now, Lord, behold their threatenings. They go to prayer. Grant unto thy servants that we can get out of this mess and that we will be delivered from this. Thank you, brother. Steve looks up like, what is he reading? <laughs> Thank you. I got the reaction I was hoping for. Is that what the text says? No. That with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to be he to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. There it is. What should we do? That's it right there. Maintain the course. Maintain the course. William Gurnall in his Beyond Brilliant, I don't know what's after Brilliant, but Gurnall is it. In his work, The Christian in Complete Armor, this is what he says, they do not pray against suffering, but pray for boldness to preach whatever it may cost them. The desire not to be excused, the battle, but to be armed with courage to stand in it. And then he says, they had rather be lift up above the fear of suffering than have an immunity from suffering. That's 400 some odd years ago. That's true. Why? Well, because it's, the principle is from the Word of God. What should we do? Is the persecution coming? Yes, I, I, I believe it is. What should we do? Well, what did the apostles do? Stand your ground, be faithful and preach the word of God boldly. Because at the risk of sounding hokey, and I certainly don't want to do that, we are on the winning side. We are. You ever been outnumbered before in a discussion? With people who are opposing you in the word of God? It's not a big deal. It doesn't even make it a fair fight. I mean, it, I've got the word of God. I don't believe that. That's not my problem. It's not my problem. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. The bumper sticker. The bumper sticker is too long. Who cares whether I believe it or not? Right. God said it. <laughs> yeah. That settles it. <laughs> Amen. And by His grace, you know, He give us the boldness to continue to preach the gospel of Christ until He calls us home, corporately or individually. Amen. 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 Father, thank you so very much. <clears throat> Uh, for the power of your word, we thank you that you have not left us in darkness of uh, wondering what is going on, what is going to go on, what is, what's happening. We thank you, Father, that you have not left us um, having to guess that we are not to worry. For no matter what is going on around us, as was said right there in that chapter in Acts, this is working out according to your will. We just thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to be co-laborers with you. We thank you that you have redeemed us, Lord. That you have picked us up out of the miry clay. That you have given us a new heart, made us new creatures. That you have called us out of darkness into light. That you have made us kings and priests unto a peculiar people. That we should show forth your praises in this dark world. And we pray that you would give us grace and strength by the power of the Holy Spirit, as with the apostles, to proclaim and to live your word boldly unto your glory and to the bringing in of those 
who are white unto harvest, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this. Give us grace and strength, Lord, to honor you in anything that you put us through for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.